So the title of the presentation is Agroforestry Policies for Carbon, Biodiversity and Livelihoods, examples from Brazil. I will present two case studies from Brazil where agroforestry generates triple benefits for climate, biodiversity and local livelihoods and uh, identify some public policies that could strengthen this uh, triple benefit role of agroforestry. I'm going to talk about uh, examples from two of Brazil's and the world's most biodiversity-rich biomes. The first is uh, the central Amazon, specifically the Tapajós region, and uh, the second is from southern Bahia in the Atlant uh, Brazilian Atlantic Forest. So we start with uh, the Tapajós region in the central Amazon of uh, Brazil. Over a third of the Brazilian Amazon is within legally inhabited protected areas, which are uh, shown in light green on this map, and new reserves of these categories uh, continue to be uh, created, together with uh, strict protected areas, which are the uh, dark green uh, polygons and indigenous lands, which are the brown areas, these uh, very important conservation corridors that cover millions of hectares of continuously protected uh, land in the Amazon. So one of these uh, sustainable use protected areas is the Tapajós Arabians Extractive Reserve. It's a 650,000 hectares uh, sustainable use protected area created in 1998 in response to uh, conflicts between traditional communities and uh, logging companies. Uh, it's located uh, close to the city of Santarém in a zone uh, that has, uh, is under uh, high land use pressure uh, presently from infrastructure development and with about uh, 20,000 inhabitants in uh, 74 communities is also one of the most uh, populous protected areas in the Amazon. So what is an extractive reserve? In a way, an extractive reserve is a form of an environmental service reward mechanism where the government provides secure land tenure to traditional communities and in return these communities have to commit to environmental conservation. In these reserves the land is not privately owned, it is owned by the government, but the tenure situation allows uh, long-term investment in land use activities in line with the management plan of the reserve, which means in uh, specific zones. Because of the low profitability of extractivism in species-rich uh, tropical forests, economic, uh, the economic and ecological viability of extractive reserves has been questioned very early on, already in the early 1990s, after the first extractive reserve was created. This criticism does not apply to those extractive reserves whose economic basis is actually not extractivism but family agriculture and agroforestry and this is the case for the Tapajós Arabians extractive reserve. So this solves one problem but uh, immediately creates another one and this is how to ensure that the land use in these reserves is environmentally and economically sustainable. Now currently this sustainability is questionable for the Tapajós Arabians extractive reserves. This is because the reserve inhabitants live mostly from slash and burn agriculture which is considered by themselves hard work and uh, generates very little income with uh, almost no opportunity for value aggregation. There are lots of deforested areas, especially around the communities and along the rivers, uh, many of them dating from before the creation of the extractive reserve. And there is a certain threat of expansion of this slash and burn agriculture into the forested uh, core area of the reserve. The Tapajós region distinguishes itself within the Amazon by having a century-old tradition of planted rubber agroforests uh, on farmland that is now almost dormant. In most of the rest of the Amazon, rubber is tapped from uh, trees growing wild in the forest. So here it's from planted trees. This tradition is, is almost dormant, but recent price increases in government, uh, government subsidy for rubber from the Amazon have now revived the interest. Now these 
traditional rubber agroforests that you see on these photos have served over the last uh, eight years or so as a model for a new type of agroforest to supply an emerging market for reforestation credits. And this is what I want to talk about. First example, Brazil has a legislation called uh, Reposition Florestal, which means more or less uh, reforestation. And this uh, legislation obliges companies that consume wood from unsustainable sources. These are sources that are not certified as sustainable management plants. Obliges these companies to either plant a corresponding number of trees, which are eight trees per cubic meter of wood consumed, or to buy uh, reforestation credits from someone who reforests on their behalf, which is a relevant case if the company, for example, does not have any own land. So in 2005, five communities in the Tapajos Arabians Extractive Reserve became accredited providers of reforestation services under this legislation, under quite lengthy and very uh, quite complex process, administrative process. Uh, and perhaps this was the first time that communities in, a, in an extractive reserve in Brazil acquired this uh, status, and uh, they started to reforest their fallow land and selling reforestation credits to companies outside of the reserve. It's important to know that selling reforestation credits under this legislation does not affect the ownership uh, of the trees. So in this uh, first pilot project, uh, the communities uh, generated about $15,000 in credit sales, this uh, benefited a community nursery in the reserve and 50 families of residents that planted trees on their land. And these people also laid the basis for a new type of tree crop agroforests, like the one that you see on the lower right, which is about a five-year-old planted agroforest. And there is uh, evidence that they have reduced their use of fire. This approach was scaled up to 46 communities currently and over 300 families with a grant from the World Bank's development marketplace competition and extremely competitive grant. So this project started to catalyze an agroforestry transition in the reserve that could have been replicated in other sustainable use protected areas throughout the Amazon. This was certainly the idea of this scaling up project. However, in the course of the decentralization of the Brazilian forestry sector in the years 2007-2008, uh, the responsibility for this Reposition Florestal legislation for its implementation shifted from federal to, the, to a state agency. And now new rules, state rules, allow companies to offset their wood consumption by paying a fee to the state government rather than buying these uh, credits from someone who has uh, reforested. And this effectively closed the credit market to the communities in the reserve. Reopening this reforestation credit market to communities would not require a change in legislation. This is actually still uh, possible under the legislation, but it would require a change in policy, specifically to encourage companies to use this way the purchase of credits to uh, compensate for their wood consumption rather than paying uh, of a fee. The benefits of this mechanism for stimulating sustainable agroforestry practices in this and uh, also other protected areas and also for communities in general, even without being in a protected area, are always uh, very readily recognized by government officials at all levels when they are confronted with this uh, project. But this policy change uh, has not yet uh, taken place. I come to the second example, which is uh, from the Cocoa region of Southern Bahia in uh, the Atlantic forest uh, zone on the, on the Atlantic coast uh, of Brazil. Until uh, the 1980s, uh, Brazil was among the world's leading cocoa producers. The cocoa tree is native to the Brazilian Amazon, but most of this cocoa actually came from the northeastern state of uh, Bahia. In this uh, area, it was grown under mixed uh, tree canopy in agroforests that are known as cabucas, and these cabucas still widely dominate the landscape on the map. The brown shades represent the cabucas, and on the photo you see a typical cabuca with native uh, forest trees. Cabucas are highly biodiverse. Uh, over 200 tree species have been uh, inventoried in uh, cabucas, and there are a number of endemic uh, fauna species as well. 
their productivity tends to be low at the currently uh, on average the 250 to 300 kilograms per hectare range. There are some Kabukas that produce a lot more, but others that produce a lot less. And this is partly because of disease, maybe the, uh, mainly the witch's broom fungus, but also because of a series of socioeconomic uh, problems related to labor, availability, indebtedness of the farms, and so on. And so there is need for some form of intensification for cocoa farming to survive on the long term in the region. Presently, intensification usually means the application of a package of practices that includes uh, the introduction of more disease-resistant cocoa varieties, sometimes diversification, for example, with rubber, more intensive management, and generally the reduction of the shade canopy. And this, of course, affects the carbon stocks of these uh, karukas. So we did a study here based on a large number of tree inventories to estimate the contribution of these karukas to the overall carbon stocks in the vegetation of the cocoa region of southern Bahia. And according to this, the karukas on private farmland harbored on about 48% of the tree covered area, 59% of the total above ground carbon stocks. Uh, forests, including those in uh, public protected areas, harbored on 17% of the area, 32% of the carbon stocks, and fallows harbored on a third of the area, only about 9% of the carbon stocks. So undisturbed forests had on average about twice as much carbon per hectare as kabukas, but since kabukas cover a much larger area, this meant that most of the carbon in the landscape is stored in uh, agroforests. In addition, while forests in this part of Brazil at least are now relatively secure, the much larger carbon stocks in Cavucas are much more threatened. So we compared carbon stocks in traditional Cavucas and in intensified Cavucas and found that about half of the carbon stocks of the Cavucas get lost upon intensification as it is uh, often done currently. If all kabukas in the region were intensified in the same manner, this would result in the release of the equivalent of 75% of the carbon contained in all natural forests of the region. To avoid progressive loss of a large percentage of the carbon stocks in the landscape of southern Bahia, there is need for incentives uh, to conserve on-farm on carbon stocks, and this uh, has to uh, include the kabukas, which contain most and the most threatened carbon in the landscape. These uh, policies cannot be, uh, have the objective to prevent intensification, which is necessary, but to encourage a form of climate smart or green intensification. Unfortunately, there seems to be a possibility for that. We found that in Kabukas, just as in native forest, uh, most of the carbon is stored in, rel in a relatively small number of large trees, while many small trees that interfere most with the cocoa actually contain only a relatively small percentage of the total carbon stocks. This means that the technical recommendations for the intensification of Kabukas must include the conservation of the largest trees. The way for this, perhaps, is that the Federal Parliament of Brazil is currently in the process of creating a green label for cocoa from Kabukas in order to help protect these traditional agroforests. And uh, depending on the specifications of what a kabuka is that will be used in this label and that remain to be uh, discussed and defined, this process could also contribute to protecting the landscape carbon stocks of the cocoa region of southern Bahia. Agroforestry has a significant potential to generate triple benefits for climate, biodiversity and local livelihoods. To what extent this potential is realized often depends on public policies. Mandatory offsets for unsustainable use of timber and fuel wood through reforestation credit markets could be a very convenient mechanism for stimulating and subsidizing an agroforestry transition in slash and burn dependent communities and uh, much, more, much easier to implement than uh, carbon markets. The necessary legislation for this already exists in Brazil, but specific policies need to be created to ensure that these markets are accessible to communities. Long established agricultural regions where forests have been reduced to fragments, as is the case in uh, the Atlantic forest region, agroforests can play a fundamental role 
for biodiversity conservation and carbon storage. This role needs to be recognized and targeted incentives and mechanisms created for its conservation that need to be compatible with land use intensification. Commodity labels could perhaps be a step in the right direction.